author's first novel is autobiography disguised as fiction. Yes, everything in my novel is true, but nothing is fact. Everything is fiction. For the moment an author begins to write, everything changes. I began writing with many things that I knew, but continued writing towards the things that I did not know, the things I needed to know. I soon understood that the novelist is no lover of facts, the novelist is a lover of truth. Truth through invention. Invention is the creation of something new resulting from study and observation and experimentation. And so, I invented many things in this novel. I invented a village in I invented an ancient Greek demigod. I invented a father. I invented a daughter. I invented an entire story. And the more I invented, the closer I got to the truth. It seemed I was digging more than writing, excavating more than composing, and all the while I discovered that the story I was writing, by virtue of being invention, a type of spectacle exposed. It was this thing that was able to reveal what I wanted to see and to learn and finally to understand. In writing this novel I wanted to understand one thing. I wanted to understand how the virtue of philosophy, how enthusiasm for ideas and wisdom and knowledge could somehow, as Edward mentioned, devolve into its opposite thing into ignorance, into confusion, obsession, and fanaticism. And so I invented this story about a daughter, Kali Palamas, and her father, Akindinos Palamas, both philosophers. The daughter, however, is an academic, the father, an autodidact. He taught himself. When the story begins, Akindinos is found dead, and Kali travels from Kupapiri in Australia to Zolopolis in Greece to bury him. There, she learns that her father's noble ambition to become a philosopher has devolved into a dark, fanatic plan to restore the life and traditions of the ancient city of Zolopolis. Her father's dream was not, as one might have expected of the village philosopher, to attain the world's knowledge, but to rewrite it to suit his vision of how his world should have been. Not philosophy at all. I've met, and in some cases known quite intimately, numerous real factual persons who have enthusiastically read and sought knowledge, only to then become selective and obsessive scholars, selectively receiving information about the world, selectively believing some truths about the world and denying other truths. And it was this that I wanted not simply to record as fact, but to write through it as a way of finally understanding why this was so. I once had a friend called Constantine. Well, to be truthful, Constantine is not a real, true, factual friend. He is a mix of many people that I met, and I've created this fictional, real Constantine to represent all the real people who finally became the core of the fictional character Akindinos. So the story of Constantine is this. Constantine and I became friends during a philosophy lecture in 1988 and ended our friendship 20 years later, not long after he read the manuscript of this novel. I had summarised the novel in the following way. Palimpsest, I said, is a story about high ideals and low obsessions, about what we believe and what happens when belief degenerates into fanaticism? Constantine knew that I was accusing him of being the fanatic. But he wasn't always that way. In the beginning, Constantine was an enthusiast of Greek philosophy. And so was I. Together, in those early years at the University of Sydney, we experienced a kind of ecstasy, enthusiasm, yes. We were new to the realm of rationalism and logic and unschooled in such methods we could only work on the force of our emotion and enthusiasm until such passions were tamed, until our minds became the stronger force. It was philosophy 
that would train our intellect so that we could see things as they were and not as we imagined they should be. It was in philosophy that we were going to encounter this thing called understanding, this thing called truth. We felt elated. We were intoxicated back then. We became immortal. The world as we knew it had <coughs> suddenly expanded and it was this new thing that had touched us, this awesome new thing. Knowledge. We felt a kind of awe. There was so much of it and a pride because it all began with the Greeks, our own ancestors. We didn't know why, we hardly admitted it in the beginning, but there it was, coming from the undisputed expert, from Bertrand Russell himself. We only needed to turn to chapter one of A History of Western Philosophy to confront this extraordinary statement. Nothing is so surprising or so difficult to account for as the sudden rise of civilization in Greece. Much of what makes civilization had already existed for thousands of years in Egypt and Mesopotamia and had spread thanks to neighboring countries. But certain elements had been lacking until the Greeks supplied them. What they achieved in art and literature is familiar to everybody, but what they did in the purely intellectual realm is even more exceptional. What occurred, continues Bertrand, <coughs> was so astonishing that, until very recent times, men were content to gape and talk mystically about the Greek genius. Like all Greeks living in the Antipodes, Constantine and I had experienced a lifetime of being told just how superior we were to all the other races. Our parents, who had left uh, poor old Greece in the 60s, with nothing more than a suitcase filled with a change of clothes and a thousand dreams, had nothing more to offer us than hard work, monetary support towards our studies, and the mysteries and potential of belonging to the race that had invented everything. Constantine and I were happy to be Greeks, but Constantine became zealous and obsessive about the Greeks. He very quickly dismissed everything that was not Greek. I read widely and I encouraged him to do the same, but he would not. There is nothing more to this than this, Catherine, he would say. Western philosophy is nothing but a series of footnotes to Plato. We don't need to read further. We have everything we need right here. In the novel, Akintinos Palamas echoes my friend Constantine when he says to his daughter, Callie, when you read Philosophy Callisto, you discover that the revolution of the mind occurred with the Greeks, and there has never been another revolution since, and there will never be another revolution in the future. Clearly, the Greeks were like no other humans on this planet, for no other race has ever done what the Greeks did, and no other race will ever do what the Greeks did. Where do you think they came from, <laughs> Callisto? <laughs> Someone likes that. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Akininos continues to his daughter. Where do you think they came from, Callisto? Surely the Hellene was not born of this earth. And so, my friend Constantine, and in the novel, Akindinos, become contemptuous of everything that is not a Greek idea. And the more I encouraged Constantine to move on from the Greeks, the more he accused me of being anti-Hellene, an anti-Hellenic. As our friendship became more and more impossible, I began writing about a man who finally transformed into Akindinos, Balamas. 